So, today's topic, as request, right before people start to think, Bhante, this is a self-serving endeavor. <laughs> How to support the Sangha. Okay, I was requested to give a talk on this topic, so now you're going to get it. Um, this, uh, the majority of the content uh, here is actually found in the uh, uh, Vinaya, which is the monastic rules of conduct. So a lot of the stuff that you're going to be hearing, that I'm reading out at least, uh, will be um, directly from the Pali Text Society's I.B. Horner translation uh, with some editorial by Bhikkhu Brahmali of Perth. So let's see how we go on this topic of supporting Sangha, both monks and nuns. Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhassa. Which means homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully awakened one. So normally I will start a sutta off with thus have I heard. Most suttas start that way. But in the Vinaya it's not usually that way. So you're just going to get the uh, standard formula. So this part, the first part, is called Nisagya Pachitya 1. Nisagya means to forfeit. Pachitya means confess. is probably not the right word, but to, basically to get off your chest, if that makes sense, if you understand what I mean by to get off your chest, to, to uh, inform somebody else of something. It's not a confession as in the Christian sense of going to a confession, for example. Okay, at one time the enlightened one, the Lord, was staying at Vesali in the Gotamaka shrine. At that time, three robes were allowed to monks by the Lord. So those of you who don't know what the three monks, uh, three monks, three robes are, this one is called the upper robe. Um, the jackets aren't allowed at the time of the Buddha, but usually because they have a military kind of connotation, jackets worn back then, leather with metal studs and things like this, all worn by princes. Either way, not really suitable for monks to be wearing that kind of gear. So right now I'm not wearing a battle vest or something which probably only the most wealthy people in the world would wear. And so this, this is one robe, this one. The second one is the lower robe, which looks basically like a skirt, but it doesn't have any elastic bands or clasps which is why we have to have a fabric belt on it to keep it all together. There's a rule for monks not to run. For obvious reasons, one will hope. <laughs> one would run without one's robes eventually. Okay, so those are the two. And the other one that you might see, you might see in the Thai tradition on photos, you see the, uh, the robe which is hanging over the shoulder. Okay, that's called the outer robe, okay, or sangati in Pali. So those are the three robes. That's it. There's nothing else. That's your wardrobe. Right? Nighttime wear, evening wear, dinner wear. Okay, it's not plates, it's this. Just the three robes. Just so you can have an appreciation for, for the concept here. So at that time, the three robes were allowed to the monks by the Lord. The group of six monks, now historically the group of six monks were just naughty monks, right? That they're responsible for many of these rules being created. Right? So the group of six monks thinking three, lo three robes are allowed by the Lord, gone into the village with one set of robes, remained in the monastery in another set of three robes, went down to bathe in another set of three robes. Those who are modest monks looked down upon, criticised, spread it about, saying, how can the group of six monks wear an extra robe? Then these monks told the matter to the Lord. Is it true, as is said, monks, that you wear an extra robe? It is true, Lord, they said. The enlightened one, the Lord rebuked them, saying, How can you foolish men wear an extra robe? It is not foolish men for pleasing those who are not yet pleased. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. When the robe material is settled... When a monk's katina privileges have been removed, an extra robe may be worn for at most 10 days. For him who exceeds that period, there is an offence of expiation involving forfeiture. So just a note if you think, what's a katina? And so the katina is a cloth, 
Um, and uh, well, Katina is a period of time after the rains residence, which is roughly October. And it goes for four months. During that period of time, monks are allowed to gather cloth to create a robe. Back at the time of the Buddha, there was very little packaged robe sets with bowls given. Such things just didn't occur. Normally, the cloth was given, and the monks had to physically sew up a robe for themselves, um, cutting all the parts and then stitching it all together. It's very labour-intensive kind of work. Um, so just to repeat, when the robe material is settled, which means you have enough robes, a cloth, and amongst Katina privileges have been removed, which means the four months is finished, or the Sangha has agreed to dispense with that Katina period. An extra robe may be worn for at most 10 days. After that, you have to confess it and forfeit it. So literally, I've got two of the three here on stage right now. If I was to have another one of these, I can hold it only for 10 days. So sometimes people think they're doing us a great favour by offering us another set of robes. And the Buddha doesn't like that idea, right? Mainly because people complain and criticise monks for having too much. At the time of the Buddha, robe material was extremely expensive. Cotton was expensive. So even just an upper robe is a big deal. Now it might seem quite cheap, okay, and maybe mass manufactured in certain um, Buddhist countries. So the price might seem quite low. It's quite commonly available now, in, especially in a wealthy society. But at the time of the Buddha, for a poor society, such things were expensive, hard to come by, and valued greatly. And therefore, monks at that time, and nuns, did a lot of things which were not appropriate in order to procure a robe. They asked for the material at the wrong time, or they asked for more than one robe. So as the group of six monks here demonstrated through greed, they had three sets for this occasion, three sets for that occasion. So they had all this fabric. And of course, when you have a lot of things, you have to store them. And where do you store them? You have to store it somewhere. If you don't live in a monastery, then where are you going to store them? You have to carry them around on your back. So you look like you're a merchant. In another rule, the lay people were saying, oh, venerable, are you selling your, your cloths at the market? Like a market person, right? So they criticised the monks for carrying too much cloth, even wool, being criticised for carrying a bundle of wool. That's another rule. I won't get into that one. Next one, Nisagya Pachitya 6. Whatever monk should ask a man or a woman householder who is not a relation of his for a robe, except at the right time, there is an offence of expiation involving forfeiture, this is the right time in the case if a monk becomes one whose robe is stolen or whose robe is destroyed. In this case, this is the right time. Okay, so when we are looking at the right time to give a robe, it's when it's been lost or destroyed or stolen. So sometimes people at the end of the rains, they would like to give a lot of robes to monks and nuns. This is a tradition but it's not what the Buddha is asking us as monks and nuns to do. Rightly speaking, we should deny and not accept excess robes to what we actually have if our three robes are in order. The Buddha himself did this. People tried to offer, probably with the idea of getting merit, uh, I want to get merit, so I'm going to offer to the Buddha. So they try to offer the three robes, and the Buddha simply says to them, but my three robes are in order, they're in good repair, I have no requirement for robes. Please dispense with that as you see fit. He didn't accept it, not even with the idea of merit and all this kind of business. Because you make the merit by the sheer fact that you've offered anyway. Whether we accept or not, you still make the same merit because your intention is kama. The intention underneath is what is driving it. The emotional state of your mind plus the action of trying to fulfill that requirement of giving, of dana, actually is the merit itself. Whether the monk or nun receives the robe is not actually all that important. So you've gone to the effort, you've got a present for your kid, you give it to the kid and they say, oh, I'm not really that interested. It's underwear again. Happy Merry Christmas. <laughs> Maybe you genuinely think they need underwear or they would be excited by the prospect of socks or underwear. The kids these days are a bit different. And they probably see underwear and socks as being, and maybe that's a very good example, socks and underwear. Maybe 40 or 50 years ago, that was like, wow, that's great. 
right? Or maybe when things were, the times were not so good, the economy was rough, getting clothes, brand new clothes, that's wow. But now it's, kids will just look at that like, and this is not the present, surely. This is just clothing, right? So in a similar way, the times have adjusted to now where kids don't look at that as being all that impressive. Back at the time of the Buddha, kind of any types of cloth were kind of highly valued and, pra- and really sought after, especially by monks. Okay, so here you have the concept of being allowed to be given something, but at the right time, and that time is when things have been, you, you actually don't have enough to wear. Literally, it's a necessity unless you're going to walk around naked and the Buddha doesn't allow monks to walk around naked. Hopefully for obvious reasons. Okay, next one. Nisagya Pichitya. Again, this is a confession plus relinquishing. At Rajagaha, in the bamboo grove at the squirrel's feeding place. Now, at that time, the venerable Upananda, he's another legend. Because of him, we have many rules. Thank you, venerable Upananda. Now, the problem is he was the son of the Sakyans. Okay, so he's of a kind of a, a royal lineage. Was dependent as a regular diner on a certain family in Rajagaha. When solid food or soft food came to that family, a portion from that was set aside for the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans. Now at that time, meat came one evening to that family. A portion of that was set aside for the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans. And a young boy belonging to that family, getting up in the night, towards morning cried, Give me meat! Then the man spoke thus to his wife, ah, give, give the boy the master's portion, the venerable Upananda's portion, give it to him. Having got another portion in exchange, we will give that to the master. Then the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans, dressing in the morning and taking his bowl and robe, approached the family, and having approached, he sat down at the appointed seat. Then that man approached the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans, having approached, having greeted the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans, He sat down at a respectful distance. As he was sitting at a respectful distance, that man spoke thus to the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans. Yesterday evening, honoured sir, some meat came. A portion from that was set aside for you. This young boy, honoured sir, got up in the night towards the morning and cried, Give me meat! And the master's portion was given to that boy. What could you get with a kahapana, honoured sir? The kahapana is a coin. The use of kahapanas is given up by me, sir, he said. Yes, honoured sir, it is given up. Nevertheless, you can give me the kahapana, sir, he said. Then that man, having given the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans, a kahapana, looked down upon, criticised, spread it about, saying, Just as we accept gold and silver, so do these recluses, the sons of the Sakyans, accept gold and silver. Monks heard that man who spread it about. Those were modest monks. Spread it about saying, how can the venerable Upananda, the son of the Sakyans, accept gold and silver? Then these monks told the matter to the Lord. He said, is it true, as is said, that you, Upananda, accepted gold and silver? It is true, Lord. The enlightened one, the Lord, rebuked him, saying... How can you, foolish man, accept gold and silver? It is not foolish man for pleasing those who are not yet pleased. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. Whatever monk should take gold and silver, or should get another to take it for him, or should consent to its being kept in deposit for him, there is an offence of expiation involving forfeiture. So that one there, uh, the gold and silver rule, meaning money or anything which is of a legal tender, which can be used for trade. Literally at that time they had wooden coins. They also had some uh, metal coins as well, but wooden ones are more common because they're cheaper to produce. We'll go into the next one, Nisagya Pichitya 18. Among the Sakyans in Kapilavatu at the Banyan Monastery, now at that time Mahanama, the Sakyan, had abundant medicine, then Mahanama, The Sakyan approached the Lord, and having approached, having greeted the Lord, he sat down at a respectful distance as he was sitting down at a respectful distance. Mahanama, the Sakyan, spoke thus to the Lord. I want, Lord, to invite the order to accept medicine for four months. Very good, Mahanama. 
Well then, you, Mahanama, invite the, law, invite the order to accept medicine for four months. The monks, being scrupulous, did not consent. They told this matter to the Lord. He said, I allow you, monks, to accept an invitation to accept a requisite for four months. Then monks asked Mahanama, the Sakyan, for a little medicine. Although Mahanama, the Sakyan, had abundant medicine as before, a second time did Mahanama, the Sakyan, approach the Lord, spoke thus to the Lord, I want, Lord, to invite the order to accept medicine for an additional four months. Very good, Mahanama. Well then, you, Mahanama, invite the order to accept medicine for an additional four months. The monks, being scrupulous, did not consent. They told this matter to the Lord. He said, I allow you, monks, to accept a renewed invitation. Then monks asked Mahanama the Sakyan for just a little medicine, although Mahanama the Sakyan had abundant medicine as before. A third time did Mahanama the Sakyan approach the Lord and spoke thus, I want, Lord, to invite the order to accept medicine for life. Very good, Mahanama. Well then, you, Mahanama, invite the order to accept medicine for life. The monks, being scrupulous, did not consent. They told this matter to the Lord. He said, I allow you monks to accept a permanent invitation. Now at that time, the group of six monks, here we go, had become improperly dressed, improperly clothed, not decently attired. Mahanama the Sakyan became a speaker. Why are you honoured sirs improperly dressed, improperly clothed, not decently attired? On going forth, should not one become properly dressed, properly clothed, decently attired? The group of six monks grumbled at Mahanama the Sakyan then it occurred to the group of six monks, hmm, now what way could we bring shame to Mahanama the Sakyan? Then it occurred to the group of six monks, the order is invited by Mahanama the Sakyan to accept medicine. Come, your reverences, let us ask Mahanama the Sakyan for ghee. Then the group of six monks approached Mahanama the Sakyan and having approached, they spoke thus to Mahanama the Sakyan, Sir, we want a donor measure of ghee. Honoured sirs, wait this day only. People are going to the cattle pen to get ghee. You may fetch it in the morning. A second time, a third time, did a group of six monks speak thus. Do you, sir, not give what you invited us to accept because you do not desire to give what you invited us to accept? Then Mahanama the Sakyan looked down upon, criticised, spread it about, saying, how can these reverend sirs being told Wait, only this day people are going to the cattle pen to get ghee. You may fetch it in the morning. And he spread that about. Those who were modest monks spread it about saying, How can this group of six monks being told by Mahanama the Sakyan to wait could not wait for just one day? Is it true as it is said that you monks being told did not wait? It is true, Lord. The enlightened one, the Lord, rebuked them saying, How can you foolish men being told by Mahanama the Sakyan to wait for just one day? could not wait. It is not foolish men for pleasing those who are not yet pleased. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. When a monk is not ill, an invitation to accept a requisite for four months may be accepted, unless there is a renewed invitation, unless there be a permanent invitation. If one should accept for longer than that, there is an offence of expiation. Okay, so there's a few rules there about being uh, difficult to look after, <laughs> some of these monks were. So the, one of the first rules was about uh, the acceptance of a robe at the right time and uh, how you deal with that and how many robes you should have and the correct answer is three robes. Um, personally, I have four. I have another under robe, mainly because I'm teaching a fair bit and when I'm teaching a fair bit, sometimes it's just not convenient me, for me to be up here in a wet robe. Uh, especially an under robe, because the rest of the couch or the, the cushions, etc., would get wet. Sometimes I have given a talk with a slightly damp upper robe. It really depends on whether there's a, a, a drying machine available or not, uh, such as the, the day sometimes uh, that I don't have time even for washing. It takes a couple of weeks sometimes for me to get to a washing machine <laughs> and wash my robes. But when I'm in other countries, like I'm in Sri Lanka or something, and I'm living in a hut in the forest, it's 30 minutes up a hill, nobody's going to walk up there to see me. So then I just use one of my three robes, the outer robe. I use that to cover the body and I wash all my other robes. So I'm not naked because I have one robe on because it's unlikely that anybody will come up to see me. It's not, you know, indecent or anything like that. 
So this is how a forest monk practices. He doesn't have a whole chest full of clothes and a, a drawer full of and a wardrobe full of. You travel lightly. So that when you travel, you just have a shoulder bag, if that, and your bowl. And you travel that way, very light, very easy. And you don't have to look after things in terms of... Uh, I mean, the more clothes you've got, the more things you have to repair, the more things you have to wash. You end up with a laundry basket full of clothes to wash at the end of the week. But, I, but, but as a monk, you, you don't, or you, you shouldn't have that much to worry about or to look after. So if you want to support monastics, think and try to think as much as you can in terms of the simplicity. If you give an invitation to the monastics, the invitation is to ask for something. Then The invitation isn't a guarantee contract. It's not a verbal contract where you're saying, Venerable, you can ask for whatever you like and I am compelled to give it. This is not the case. In that case, monks will be asking for Ferraris and mansions and helicopters, first class tickets, although I'm sure some monks do ask for first class tickets. Right, but this again is not appropriate. I've known of a monk who has accepted first class tickets to travel um, in, in terms of a plane ticket. And there was a semi-drunk American man on that plane in the first class with him. He went up to him and he says, it's a bit much, isn't it, really, this first class ticket for you? Now, this is a very reputable teacher. He's a Westerner. He's not in Australia. He's elsewhere. Well known, highly respected. But when you have these kinds of episodes, it makes you question and wonder. Where's the renunciation factor here for that monastic? And it's important to understand, too, that monastics should try renunciation. That's the kind of business that we're in, really, or should be. And giving first-class tickets, what do you think? Is that renouncing? Yes, it is. It's renouncing cattle class, <laughs> uh, economy class tickets. <laughs> uh, for myself, I know I give, I give free kidney massage on every flight to the person in front of me, sitting in front of me. With my knees, I give them a free kidney massage, um, whether they want it or not. Uh, especially the more budget the airline, the, the less room I have in front, so I tend to give freely, um, although it does come at some expense to my knees. But even in such situations, you can always lash out and hope that a supporter might have compassion to give an extra maybe 50 bucks for an exit row seat for those taller monastics. Um, Sometimes even premium economy, maybe, or business starting to get a bit risky. Depends on some airlines business class is actually less than a premium economy on others. It just depends on what kind of airline you're traveling with. But the intention is important underneath that. What's the intention? The intention for the monk is important for the monk. Like, am I renouncing? Why am I accepting this particular offer of uh, first class or business class. If somebody was really sick or ill and they can only lie down and they've got a drip, okay, maybe they have to go into first class because they can't sit in the, in the, in the normal seat. But unless it's like a medical lift or something like this, then why, why are you taking a first class seat with the actors and the presidents and you know all these uh, important people or wealthy people? This is not the areas where monks should be hanging out. Although the Buddha spoke to kings, occasionally invited to the palace to speak to kings and queens, uh, he would not stay there. He would come, he would speak to the people and then leave. He would only do that as part of like, it's almost like business. It's like, okay, I fulfilled my business for being here and now I'm off. I'm not going to stay there any longer than necessary. And he even tells Ananda, try to avoid going to the palace because people will look down upon you and people will raise suspicions. Well, you know, why are you hanging out in the palace? You know, especially if there's women around and stuff like this. Why would you be hanging around the palace with all the courtesans, right? So Ananda's a bit of a softy in some respect. He has compassion for others and he's happy to teach. Um, but other monks, like Mahakasapa, don't think he's doing the right thing and he should be in the forest by himself, being the hard man of Dhamma, wearing rough robes, just rag robes and all these kinds of stuff. So even within the monastics, uh, you'll get criticised if you seem to be doing something too luxurious. And as lay people... You are the only vector that we have to rightfully gain anything, including food, including robes, including lodgings, everything. Travel, apart from our walking, we can walk. Yes, we don't have to you know, get lay people to help us walk, 
but apart from that kind of travel, everything else is supplied by you. Taxis or picking monks up and dropping nuns down to the hospital or whatever, this is all through you. Um, I was on the recent trip uh, overseas and I was a bit horrified to see on my schedule where it said limo, limo, picked up by limo and driven to such and such a place. And I, and I went, what? <laughs> I said, I think we need to change something here. Maybe my understanding is wrong. So the limo did turn, up to, turn out to be a sedan, okay? A normal sedan, it was a four-cylinder. I was uh, close to giving kidney massages in that car. So it wasn't luxurious at all, okay? So <laughs> I was kind of relieved. But I did inquire as to please make sure that actually this isn't a limousine. You know, I'm not a pop star with my sun, sunglasses on and signing CD covers as I'm leaving a, a, a limo. That's not the right thing for a monk or nun to be involved in. When it comes to the supply of requisites, the Buddha says there are four basic requisites, requirements, if you think of it in this way, for a monastic to live. Food, shelter, clothing and medicine. You need those things. The rest of it is want. I have a tablet, I use that to do my study, right? But it's a want, it's not a need. Sometimes people are pressured by monks, right? Or pressured by nuns. Get me organic such and such garlic. I only eat organic garlic or tomatoes or whatever. That's a want, okay? It's not a need. And some people will spend 50, 60 bucks on one meal for one monastic. This is crazy. You might as well just send them off to the regent, right? Five star or six star restaurant, be done with it. You know, I'm sure it's all organic and permaculture or whatever. But this is not what we ordain for. You aren't actually helping us by doing things like this. You're, all you're doing is propping up a monk or nun's crazy um, requirement list in their head. If you can identify a legitimate medicinal requirement for that, it's fine. For example, if somebody's got gastroenteritis, you, they can't eat chili, right? They're not looking for five-star chili or three-star chili. They're looking actually no chili. I was in that situation, okay? If I consume that, it's not medicinal. It's the opposite. I end up going to ringing doctors asking, what can I use to neutralize this burning sensation in my stomach, right? And that creates another problem. So unless it's something like that, but usually it's a negation. I can't take that. Not I need to have this type of thing, right? There's a difference. There are other foods that you can eat apart from chili which will sustain your life, right? So knowing or understanding the difference between a medical requirement and legitimate health concern as opposed to just satisfying the sense base of the tongue, right? Monastics, and myself included, will be guilty from time to time with this kind of thing, some more than others. And another one is in terms of travel. A monastic asks for travel and you ask, oh, where do you need to go? I need to go to see the pyramids in Egypt. Was the Buddha enlightened at the pyramids? No. Did he visit the pyramids? Not to our understanding. So why are you going? Some monks like to go on holidays. They forget. Every day that you're wearing a robe is a holy day, <laughs> right? Not wearing three, uh, three dozen robes, just one set of robes is enough. A set of three is fine. It's a holy day. That's where the term holiday comes from, holy day. It's an observance day. So every day I wake up and I don't forget what I am. Well, oh, that's right, I'm a monk. No matter what kind of dream you may have had, right, you wake up, ah. Oh, you don't need much of a reminder. It's a kind of a uniform colour. It's usually what other people aren't wearing. It's simple enough. Actually, sometimes it's actually complicated. But it's enough. So why do I need to go to Egypt? Am I going to convert the Muslim population in Egypt? Is that the, is that the reason why I'm going to Egypt? I don't think so. Am I going there to practice under the Bodhi tree, which doesn't exist? I don't think so. And even so, going to see the four holy sites in India, is that a want or a need? Does the Buddha say every monk must visit these four holy sites? For those of you who are not familiar with the suttas, 
No, he doesn't. He doesn't say for monks it's compulsory to see the four holy sites. What he says is it's compulsory to see four other things. This is suffering. This is the cause of suffering. This is the ending of suffering. And this is the way leading to the ending of suffering. In other words, he asks monks and nuns to see the Four Noble Truths. You don't have to travel anywhere to see those. Right here, right now, in your current lifestyle, perhaps you can see these Four Noble Truths. You don't have to get on the plane, first class, travel to India, wearing a tuxedo. It's not required. It's your duty as lay people to inquire as to the requirements of the monastics. Yes, and it's also up to your wisdom to discern what is needed and not needed, as opposed to what is wanted. There are a lot of... Monastics can be full of wants, but it doesn't mean that you should satisfy them. You should have some wisdom. And the Buddha says it's important when you are giving to give at the right time something which is needed, something which is beneficial at the right time. Clothing might be beneficial, but not when I've already got three robes and I've got enough clothing. Please don't donate more clothing thinking we need more clothing. Usually storerooms in monasteries have 400 pairs of socks, usually all size 10, which I can't wear any of them, but I'm glad to see another pair of size 10 socks coming into the monastery. For what point? It just sits there. That's not good. Are you really wanting to just see your hard-earned money invested in socks end up in a drawer not used? Would you do that for yourself? What are you doing, honey? I'm buying some more socks. What for? I've got a lot, but I just thought I'd like to store some more. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> do you just have a room full of spare clothes that you don't intend to wear? Some people might. Some people are shopaholics, perhaps. But not for monks, not for nuns. The easiest thing you can do is just to ask, is there anything that you need? And I can proudly say, I say no most of the time. I get asked a lot, do you need anything? Yesterday I was asked. Twice, do you need anything? Nope, I'm fine, thank you. Appreciate the offer, it's very kind. But I don't need anything, I'm okay, I've got enough. I had breakfast, I had lunch, I got my three robes. Sorted. I don't have to get an air ticket anywhere right now. It's okay. It's great. It's enough. I'm happy. In this way, you're reinforcing contentment for the monastics. You're reinforcing also renunciation for the monastics. This is how you really take care of monastics. Try to understand that they're trying to move away from acquisitions. It's not that having things is the problem, but it's the wanting for things which is the issue. The desire is the issue. So if you've got enough, whether you're lay or monastic, why would you need more? Can you be content with what you just have? Okay, you've got a husband. He's a bit grumbly. He's a bit feral. His knees don't work. Right? But you know, that could be worse. Can you be content with that? Yeah, okay, maybe he doesn't speak nicely all the time, but occasionally he does good things around the place. Is that good enough? Can I be content with that? You know, my wife, she doesn't cook all that well because I'm lazy, I don't want to cook. I ask her to cook. But I, I, the fact that she even bothers to do that, that's amazing. She makes that effort. Can I be content with that? Can we be content with that that we have? And this is the, this is the root of renunciation, is contentment. And on the basis of contentment comes happiness. If you want to see happy monks and nuns, the worst thing you can do is give them plenty of options. You could go here for a holiday, or you could go there for a holiday, or you could go whale watching, or you can go to the see Uluru, or you could... I'm an Australian. I haven't seen Uluru. Right? I'm not a young Australian either. There's plenty of opportunities for me to have seen Uluru as a layman. I didn't take them then. Why would I want to take it now? For what purpose would I need to go? Whales, I've seen them on documentaries. I have faith, albeit blind faith perhaps, that they exist in the ocean. It's okay. It's an, I don't need to see whales to practice the Four Noble Truths and understand. I'm not a monk for the purpose of tourism or travel. 
Sometimes people say to me, Bhante, do you have a nice holiday overseas? When I go overseas, do you have a nice holiday? I go, well, what was that? What, ho what holiday are you talking about? The part where I was teaching, going from place to place, probably not sleeping enough. Was that the holiday that you're talking about? <laughs> it's more like a work trip. There's a schedule. If you've got a schedule when you're going on holiday, you've, you've misunderstood the concept of a holiday, okay? So if you want to support, support in the right way. So give, give what's required. Ask is the best, ask. Don't just give another yellow robe and a bowl thinking you're making great kama. You're not. You didn't put much thinking into it. It's just like me buying a Christmas present for you. Bunte Jake's going to get me a Christmas present. So I'll roll up on Christmas Day, knock on your front door and go, here you go. It's an Alsatian. You go, I've got a two-bedroom unit. Doesn't matter. Here you go. I didn't think about it. Didn't you always want a dog? No, never. I've got two cats. Well, may you be happy? And then I walk off. <laughs> is that how I, as a friend, would think? Or as somebody who wants to support you, is that how I give a gift? Great, now that this Alsatian can eat the two cats. Or they can <laughs> cause a big mess in their house or whatever, right? So this is where the Buddha says, what is beneficial at the right time, something which is needed. My friend with two cats doesn't need an Alsatian, right? They pro you could get flea collars, maybe that's needed. But best thing, rather than me guessing, I just ask, what is it that you need or what is it that you enjoy? I watch them, I understand, I know what they like. Then I've got a better idea if I'm going to get them a gift. But best still, you hear that they say some, they drop something in a conversation. Oh, I've been after a such and such for a long time. One day I'll get that. Oh, then you remember that. Then you get them something that they actually need. This is good. I know I'm saying this out of gratitude, okay? People go through a lot of trouble to feed monastics, give us clothes, get us from point A to point B, supplying shelter, electricity for warmth and heating and cooling. This is great, okay? And I appreciate all of that. Giving more than what's required, though, is not helping the monastics. So it's very important to hold back, to watch, and then when you have doubt, ask the question, what is it that you really need? Do you need anything? And if that monastic says no, you should be very happy. Because you can think, well, they, they've, they're, they're happy with what they've got. They don't need anything more. They're actually renouncing the world. They're not being greedy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That... When they say no, it should bring a smile to your face. And the fact that you've asked, you've already made good karma because you're being generous in asking, going out of your way to ask. Now, you have to mean it, though. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't go, oh, Bante, would you like some food? Yes. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose I can get you a coffee. Well, as long as I don't have to make it. <laughs> okay. You don't want to have that kind of mentality, of course. So if you mean it and you're genuine, then yeah, you make the good cover that comes along with that. But not just to give things away to monks and nuns. So the rains is coming up shortly in a couple of weeks, the rains, will, rains residence period, the time when the monastics have to re reduce their travel, right? They're not allowed to just go on tour, roaming around wherever they feel like going. We have to determine the places that we stay in that three-month period. So we kind of, based upon the fact that it was flooding during the rains or the monsoon period in India 2,600 years ago, and that's an unsafe time to travel. Cross a, tree, a creek when it's flooded and a good chance that you'll be swept downstream, possibly killed. So it was based upon that. These days in Australia, it's a different hemisphere. Um, we don't have the rains like they have the monsoons during this time of the year in Asia. So the importance of it is somewhat diminished. Nevertheless, we still observe it <clears throat> uh, for the most part. And some Western monasteries will actually change it when it's snowing. They have their rains residence period um, because you can't do much when it's snowing outside. It's two foot, three foot of snow. There's no sweeping to be done. Uh, and there's no mowing grass or whatever, right? It's, you can't do any of those activities. Building is incredibly difficult to do, so you don't. You go into slow motion and go into hibernation mode. That's it seems to be keeping in line with the spirit of the Buddha's intention for the rains. And it's also the time when the monastics should be actually communicating with other monastics in the one place. It actually should be the learning time. 
Usually these days it's upside down. These days we spend most of our year talking to people and three months in meditation or retreat. At the time of the Buddha, it's upside down. It's, it's nine months of the year in meditation, three months of discussing with those monks who can't go anywhere else. You're trapped here, aren't you, Venerable? Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, great. I'd just like to ask you a whole bunch of questions. Oh. <laughs> three months of this. All right, this, that's the opportunity for teaching and engagement. <clears throat> but these days we do the opposite. So it's good to keep these points in mind. If you really want to support the Sangha, don't spoil them like little brats, including this monk here, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So spoiling them doesn't help them, right? It's like kids. If you spoil a kid, you know, then they grow up to be difficult to look after and they turn into politicians who <laughs> fight in parliament. <laughs> Not all politicians fight in parliament. It's the 90% that give the 10% a bad name. So have compassion. And true compassion means giving what's necessary at the right time. If you can follow that and, you, and you're happy for a monk or a nun to say no to you, you should be, and you should rejoice in that when they say no. Please remember that next time you try to offer something. If a monk or a nun says, no, thank you, we've got enough, please be happy because they're actually, they're actually demonstrating the quality that you're trying to support in the first place with your requisites and have been supporting with your requisites. So that is my talk this morning on how to support monks and nuns, especially now coming up to the rains, using as a basis the Buddha's own speech in terms of the rules that he's laid down for us. I hope that is beneficial to you and open up for questions and answers, should you have any. <coughs> any vinya questions? <laughs> Could be any questions. It doesn't have to be about today's talk, but... Hmm. Rule about uh, not taking coins and all the silver. Now, do they say nobody gives me coins? It's uh, paper and plastic. Paper and plastic, yep. How does that go? Gold and silver at the time of the Buddha were seen as a commodity which you can trade in. <clears throat> in other words, legal tender. They had coins back then. Um, with stamped images on it, um, just like we have coins now. But like you say, there's not a lot of people who are going to go running around with a wallet or a purse full of coins. If you do, it's just for parking meters or something like this. But even that's being eradicated. Now it's credit cards, swipe cards, or things like this. Um, if we look in the vineyard, there is a concept called... Um, the Mendicar Allowance. The Mendicar Allowance is where the Buddha said you can have, for example, um, a classic example is a bakery just around the corner here, a loafer's bakery. Um, some lay people say, Bhante, if you would like, go to the bakery, order what you want, I'll pay for it. So they set up a tab or an account with the bakery. That's completely allowable. It's under, under the Mendicar Allowance. Uh, that the Buddha established. So uh, whilst I'm not using any money, I'm still getting you know, a pie or whatever it is from there if there's no breakfast or something. Uh, and the layperson pays for the account. So it's completely allowable. Um, <clears throat> so that idea of an account is okay. I'm not using money. I'm not handling legal tender, which is the currency of the land, which is literally dollar notes or coins. It's legal tender. And you must accept legal tender in Australia. You can't say, I, I don't accept cash, I, I only accept credit card. You, you can't, that's illegal to do that, right? Um, currently, anyway. So the use of coins, uh, silver, uh, notes, $100 notes, $50 notes, is not allowable for us because it's legal tender in this country. It's legal form of exchange. Credit card is a bit more grey. The reason for that is because the bank account, if it's your bank account, you have a problem as a monk. First off, I don't have a bank account, okay? I don't have a personal bank account. Haven't had since the whole time I've been ordained. So if you have an account, for example, let's say the BSV has an account and they attach a credit card to that and the monastery down the road there at Newbury, they need to buy some building materials for some maintenance project or something. They use that credit card. The money is taken from the BSV. It's, the monastics don't have any of that money. It's not monastics money but they're authorised to use that card to withdraw funds from the BSV. So the BSV is acting like Loafer's Bakery in this case. When you go to Bunnings to buy a plank of timber, 
and you're purchasing that timber. Bunnings is asking the BSV through whichever bank that it is, let's say which bank? The Commonwealth, let's say the Commonwealth Bank. Okay, Bunnings asked the Commonwealth Bank, do these clowns have money in their account? And they go, yeah, they do. And the Bunnings goes, great, we'll take that money. At no point in time is that monastic saying, this is my money and I get to own this at the end of this process. It's not, it, it's BSVs the whole way through in that example. So that can be used technically. Does it look good for a monk to have a credit card? No, because the casual observer will see the monk with a credit card and go, clearly that's his. So this is a bit of a problem. So how, then how do you do things in monasteries? How many people accept checks these days? Checks are okay, it's a promissory note. It's a promise of payment. It's not actually legal tender. You can say to me as a shopkeeper, Bunte, you're a clown, we don't, you see the sign? Checks. You see the bouncing motion like the kangaroo with that check? That's why we don't take them anymore, right? I don't want to pay $20 to see if you've got money in your account, right? Which is what a bounce, I don't know how much it is these days, it's probably more. $9 for a bounce check, okay. But still, I don't want to lose $9 to experiment whether or not you've got money in your account. That's your problem, it shouldn't be my problem, right? So people don't accept checks. It's less and less and less and less these days. And even as a monk, you wouldn't sign a check anyway. You'd have to get some, a lay committee to sign a check. Which lay committee wants to, every time, oh, we need a bag of nails. How much? $3.50. Can you write a check for that? So you're having to work this kind of situation. Is it realistic? Is it possible? When, especially when you live in a monastery 100 plus kilometres away from a major population base, there are challenges to be met. And as I said, most, most organisations are moving away from checks these days. How does the organisation pay for the requirements to keep the monastery afloat? But personal accounts, definitely not. If a monk has a personal account or accepts money, as specified there by the Buddha, even accepting it to be deposited near him is, offense, is an offence. It's not allowable. If somebody comes up here and says, Bhante, here's $50 for you, I have to say to them, I cannot accept that. If they leave it there then, at least I've told them, I can't accept it, I don't accept it. But if, they, if I think, oh yeah, that's good, that'll be nice, and I accept that, the, the fact that they've just put it there, not even in my hand, just put it near me for my use, and they understand that I agree to that, then I have an offence. I'm going to take that $50, I have to bring it to the Sangha, four or more monks, and I have to say to them, okay, one of you needs to be selected to deal with this. And what does deal with this mean? They have to take that $50 and find out if any medicine is required in the monastery by any of the monastics. If any of those monastics do not have a requirement for medicine, one of them is to be selected and then to take that and throw it backwards off a cliff in a place where nobody would reasonably find it. That's what we'll do with your $50. So please, if, a, if you know monastics take money, don't give them money. It's like poisoning someone and expecting them to get better. They won't destroys people's faith in the Sangha as well. They see Sangha taking money. It's like, well, what's, what did you renounce when you ordained? I renounced work and paying tax. But, uh, I get to go on holidays with all the money you give me. It's fantastic. You should be a monk too. <laughs> that's not renunciation. Okay, that's holding on to. That's wanting your cake and eating it as well. You, you can't do that. You renounce, you renounce. Anybody's welcome to go through my little pouch where I keep all my cards like a Medicare card in case I need to go to hospital health care card for the same reason. There's a credit card in there which is for the monastery's expenditures. It's not for my personal expenditures, so to speak. It's for monastic stuff out at the monastery, usually tickets or things to get me to and from places. And it's not for my holidays. And the treasurer gets the bank statement, not me. So if it says, you know... Uh, Dan Murphy's $80, <laughs> Dan Murphy's Botlo or liquor store, $80. The treasurer might well be within their rights to say, and Venerable, how did you get $80 on a Dan Murphy's on your bank statement? There's no... <laughs> Rightfully so. It's like, uh, I was watering the grass <laughs> with loving kindness. <laughs> Yes, after you drank the contents of the bottle. So this is the thing is, 
it's, um, it should be a transparent process. So currently the way the BSV does things, it's transparent. The treasurer gets the bank statement, gets to check all the expense items on the bank statement. If I was playing around and doing silly things, then I'd be caught very quickly. have used the credit card to purchase the tickets to go over, which also appears on the bank statement, yep. Do I use it to buy food? No. No. I lived in New Zealand without any credit card for four weeks in a non-Buddhist country going pindapant door to door, and I survived. I, I don't resort to credit cards for food. I'm also against the idea of monasteries using a lot of money for that purpose as well. It defeats the purpose and the point of going on pindapant. So that's the preference which I have. Yeah. Yeah. There are some traditions that, um, that uh, do have a monk, and they have the virtues, they have their paths. So do you see that as being a corruption of the Sangha as well? The Buddha says a samana should not own fields, property, <laughs> slaves, goats, men, women, and vehicles is one of those things. A, a samana, somebody who's practicing, or the son, the son of the Buddha, basically, doesn't own these things. So having cash, again, the Buddha is very clear about not having cash. It doesn't. There's no tradition apart from Dhammavinya tradition. Everything that comes after Dhammavinya is man-made or monk-made, right? This is the same thing. It's artificial. It's a deviation. So the Dhammavinya that the Buddha gives us is the example we should follow. Later on, we can make all sorts of justifications as to why we shouldn't follow it. But ultimately, we should try to understand the wisdom which is actually in that rule. Why does the Buddha not want us to have gold and silver? Because people would criticize us. When, when the story broke out in Thailand of the monk who flew in a private jet, <laughs> some of you are already laughing, right? I'd be laughing too if it wasn't for the fact it's so sad. Wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses? For what purpose? What was he doing? I've ever, even heard of monks who, you know, learning to fly or go for joy flights. What? I won't mention names. Why? Shouldn't the joy be in renunciation? Practice meditation? Trying to understand the Buddha's teaching? Isn't that really our job? As monks? What, what, have we, what business have we got with going to airports, learning to fly, going on joy flights, or flying in expensive jets? It's, it's actually very simple. If you ever have doubt about something, just ask yourself the question, would the Buddha agree to this? And the answer will be binary. It won't be, well, maybe. It's usually, would the Buddha be doing this? Yes or no? Would the Buddha wear Ray-Ban sunglasses worth $250? Take your time. Would he go flying, flying in a personal jet? Take your time. When we read about how the Buddha lived his life, it was simple. One bowl, one meal a day. Ray-Bans? First class tickets and jets? Really? Is it, was it Prince Siddhartha or King Buddha? What are we looking at? What aspect of renunciation is there when we take a first class ticket as a monk? As lay people, that's your right. You earn money, you save it up, great. Take the first class ticket. But when I take a first class ticket, it's out of your pockets. Not my pockets, your pockets. Should I be taking a first class ticket out of your pockets? For me, the answer is very simple. Would the Buddha take a first-class ticket? I know the answer to that. He was a first-class citizen, but he didn't require first-class tickets. He was a first-class citizen of what he said no to, not what he said yes to. That's the difference and the distinction. Does that answer your question? Yeah, a first. A subsequent? Okay, I'll go here then back there.
Mm. Do you think it was right that they were collecting? I, I assume they were collecting for the sucker to buy things, um, but I felt it was enforced that you had to give money. Yeah. And I, I didn't think it was right. Right. But I'm not sure if it was or not. Because I'm in a different country. Well, on the level of your heart, you felt it was wrong. It's sufficient. The Buddha says you should give where your heart inclines. Your heart didn't incline in that situation. It was actually resisting. Your head overruled your heart in that occasion. The donation box would have been fine. Sure, but, but not the monastic. Pressuring you for money. Yeah. Oh, and I joke about that sometimes. You know, there's a monastery up the road called Newberry Forest Monastery. It needs your support. But the, notice the difference between when I say that and. My bank account's empty. I need your support. I versus monastery. The monastery needs your support. The funds don't go into the pockets of the monastics. They go into the account for the BSV, which supports the monastery. The BSV is the steward. They're taking care of the monastics at the monastery through your funds. Your dana comes to the BSV, stays in the BSV account until it's needed for the monastery for the Sangha living at that monastery. The Sangha shouldn't be knocking on your door, have you got some money? We've got problem with scam monks coming into Australia. They're not monks, they're lay people dressing up. They've got their Nike shoes and their jeans on with a grey coat over the top, looking bald, selling amulets and chanting bracelets and all this kind of stuff that the Buddha would never do. Again, ask yourself, would the Buddha ever do this? No in the main street trying to raise money. And some of them saying, $20, is that all you've got? When they're giving them a $4 bracelet, or maybe even 50 cent bracelet. Is that all you got, $20, to pay for that holy amulet? Yes, there's a lot of this stuff is going around, right? In a lot of countries. The majority of the monks do not follow the rule of not handling money, right? But it's your responsibility to not make it worse. You choose where you donate. You choose what you give to, who you give to, how you give to. This is the power that you have as a lay people. And the responsibility is yours as well. Yes, the monk has the responsibility to say no when it's not appropriate. The nuns have the responsibility to decline inappropriate things as well. But it's also, it takes, you know, two to tango. If you don't put the temptation in front of my face, I don't have anything to decide upon. So don't put the cheese out for the rat. The rat being those unconscionable monks and nuns. Right? Because some of them will go for the bait. And unfortunately, they drag the Sangha down with them. The best way to support the Sangha, don't tempt them with things like that. It's not helpful. You don't actually make good karma by doing, by breaking the Buddha's own rules, you're not helping those monastics. You're creating problems, not assisting. You're not making merit here. The wrong intention. You might have the right intention to give, but you're giving the wrong things. And once you're educated about this, as you are now, there's no turning back. You've all heard this message. Straight from the Buddha's lips, not Venerable Jag, you can look this up later. I don't want you to believe me. You can check it out for yourself. And ask yourself a very simple question, would the Buddha have a, you know, a fat wallet or any wallet? Once you answer that very simple question, if you think you understand the basics of Buddhism, you should come to a very simple conclusion. No. He travelled with just one bowl and his three robes. He didn't even have a bowl stand, not even a lid for his bowl. None of these things are mentioned. None of these accessories that a lot of monks use these days. A bowl and his three robes. That's it. Can we not do the simple thing? The Buddha did the simple thing. That's what we should aim for. Your subsequent question, sir. Adana meaning food? Okay. Hmm. 
how, your question, how does the, does the food taste good or not? It changes because not everybody's a master chef. <laughs> Some people say this is salad, but it looks like porridge. <laughs> um, don't expect too much from that, <clears throat> but I, I understand and appreciate the fact that they've gone through the trouble to make it and bring it. How, how the tongue receives it is another thing. End of the day, is it sufficient for the sustenance of this body is the ultimate question in the dhammic, the dhammic side, yes. Even if it doesn't taste like salad, it's more like porridge. But nevertheless, it's not going to kill me. Well, I can still eat it. Ultimately, that's what it should come down to. But of course, you're going to taste things. They're going to have vari variations of taste. When somebody had loads something up with a lot of chilli, I just can't eat it because I suffer for hours afterwards. The purpose of eating the meal is not to create dukkha. It's to alleviate the dukkha of hunger, not to create the dukkha of other pains in the body or whatever. So sometimes I will avoid some foods. Sometimes people will be upset. Well, that's because I just don't want to feel sick. If I go to another country, I have to expect that their cuisine is not the same as what I'm used to. The only thing, as a Western monk, I, all, I typically eat Asian. In, in Australia, I eat Asian. In Asia, I eat Asian. <laughs> <laughs> because the supporters are Asians, right? Typically, a few white people turn up. It's like, what are you doing here? This is not the bus stop. <laughs> oh, sorry, we better get going, right? It's not in the white culture, really, Western culture, to, to give food and, and this kind of thing. Um, not yet. Maybe it takes a long time, generations for that to occur, right? There's very few Westerners who are inculcated with that, that value. But that's okay. Um, but, you know, as a monk, I've come to expect not to eat the stuff which I grew up with. That's just the reality of the environment. Other monks, if you're born in Asia, you get to eat rice all the time, just like when you were a child. So I'm used to this. You come to Australia, I'm still used to this. It doesn't change. There's not much of a renunciation there. Sri Lankans, monks in Sri Lanka eat Sri Lankan food, and here they'll eat Sri Lankan food. It, that doesn't change. When you're a Thai monk, you come to here, you're surrounded by your Thai friends. It's not, there's not multicultural mix in usually these monasteries. So it's usually just... What you got there is what you got here. You're not giving up much. Maybe plates and forks and knives are different, but that's, that's about it. But otherwise, the style is the same. As a Westerner, I have to renounce my culture. I have to renounce the kinds of foods that I have as well. It doesn't matter where I practice, really. So what happens here and what happens here and what happens here are three different things. Yes, it might taste good or bad, but... The person has given the food for the sustenance of this body so I can continue to practice. This is what should be kept in mind by one who is renouncing. Even though you go, oh, I'm not sure if I really like this. Well, this, you can eat it or not. That's your choice as a monk. You can eat it or not. If you don't like it, well, don't eat it. Don't complain, just don't eat it. People have gone through a lot of trouble to make food. So you have two choices. You either eat or don't eat. But never, never do I think, ah, oh, this person, what are they, crazy? I don't think that. I think it's amazing that they've gone to this trouble to bring food today. It's a rare thing to see too. Hang on, yep. But, but should I go through a lot of trouble? Or should I go through some If it's me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, as the Buddha says, you, you give as your heart inclines. If you feel preparing a meal in a certain way has certain benefits and you're happy with those benefits, then that's up to you. If you, feel, if you think it should be a bit more simple or plain for, because for you some concept in your mind makes you feel happy about that, then you do that. Okay, because some people like to treat the monks. Yeah, they do. They're, they're renunciants. They don't, don't have a lot of nice stuff. So I like to treat them. Yeah, but remember what I said too about spoiling Okay? Sometimes you don't want to need a five course meal. I mean, everything ends up in my bowl anyway. Some people insist, Bhante, here's some soup separate from your bowl. I, guess I put all my stuff in my bowl. And Bhante, please have the soup separate. Or please have the dessert separate. They, because they've, may, they've maybe gone through the trouble, they've given but not quite. So it's, it's like, here's the soup for you, Bhante, but you have to eat it in this format. I'm giving it to you but trying to control how you take it, right? 
You either give or you don't. I mean, you give a present to me, and you go, oh, I go, oh, okay, that's it. No, Bante, you can't hold it that way. <laughs> you have to unwrap it this way. I think you better keep it. <laughs> People do this quite a, quite a lot. You see it even maybe even today when the, if the food's out on the table. Bante, have you tried this? Is it yours? <laughs> Usually it is, you know, people want you to try their food, right? Unfortunately, there's, you know, 400 plates. I can only take, you know, that much of each plate and my bowl's already full. So give us your heart inclines where you feel happy. And the Buddha says to do that. When you feel happy, right? But keep in mind what's this actually for and don't go, you don't have to go over the top. You know, you don't have to hire three chefs to come out and personally serve and set things on fire and, you know, it's a bit over the top. Okay. Okay, uh, yes, and then yes. Uh, some 300 years ago in Sri Lanka, the monks did not follow the way the way people expected or the way the asked them to do. The result was that the complete uh, Sangha establishment disappeared. The, it was brought back from uh, uh, Thailand after. That was because the community expected that it was bad. Then it came back. Uh, the standard expected less from the Sangha, and we are Sangha is there. So now, uh, it, of course, Sangha is not enlightened. I mean, they have to be there to them, delusionaries, but that they are If you want to really do practice as a Samana, you should be in like a Thai first tradition, go there, meditate, just to do with the minimum. But Sangha also can do a great deal of work for the community by being among the people, doing various services, and change it to modern times. But if you develop your mind, heart, and wisdom, sometimes you may not uh, exactly what to be expected, it's not to be asked. So if you uh, raise the standards of expectations of, from Sangha, from the community, people can get disappointed if you don't see that happening. If people can get disappointed, what will happen to Sangha? Then? Same story will repeat. You can, if you set up a great expectation, you must be expect. Uh, you must also anticipate uh, great failures in um, those expectations not being met, and great disappointment will follow. However, if you set a very low benchmark, it will be attained. And the Buddha doesn't set a very low benchmark. Maybe even the Vinaya could be considered a low benchmark. It's ju it's just a series of rules. We're not talking about arahantship with these rules here. We're just talking about don't be a naughty boy. Right, um, And this kinds of stuff which really affects other people's confidence and faith. If the benchmark is set so low, well, what would the difference be between a, uh, a Buddhist monk and anybody else in society? Very little. Lay people use cash, and so do these monks. Lay people get married, and so do these monks. Well, then where's the monk? The Buddha gives us the ingredients, a requirements list, the KPI for a monk. Right? There's th literally thousands of rules. I only shared with you a few this morning. But they're KPIs, key performance indicators. Are you being a summoner? Are you being a monk? And it's unfortunate that the standard has dropped so much where it's common for people to go to Burma and say, ah, look, these monks are using money. Even in Australia, I would tell you the majority of monasteries, probably monks are using money. And this is one of the few places where the monks will probably bother to read the Vinaya. Right? We actually interrogate the text. We actually read through it, not just go, well, my teacher said. <laughs> well, your teacher can say all sorts of things. But what, is, what does the real teacher say? The Buddha was the teacher through the Dhamma and the Vinaya. Everybody else's assistant teaches. So whether it's Thailand or Cambodia or Laos, it doesn't really make a difference. It's my duty as a monk to understand the Blessed One's instructions and to fulfill them as best as I can. I will, in, I will encounter the Kama either way. I will inherit the Kama either way. Be it good or bad, so to speak. Wholesome or unwholesome. I can't give it to anybody else and I can't deflect responsibility to anybody else. I have to make a choice. Either I fulfill the requirements of what a monk is supposed to do or what a nun is supposed to do if you're a nun. Either I fulfill the Buddha's instructions to the best of my ability. It doesn't mean I won't fail from time to time. I do the best that I can. But if I'm not following that, I should stay as a lay person. 
it is better to be a lay person who follows five precepts well and eight precepts well than it is to be a, a, a corrupt monk who fails in most of his precepts. The karma associated with that is extremely uh, unwholesome and the ramifications are very heavy. No, that's from the Buddha's lips. Yep. I mean, it's paraphrased, but yeah, it's correct. The purpose of the food is a medicine to keep the body going for the purpose of attaining Nibbana. In short form, that's what it's for. Not for entertainment, not for fattening, not for games or enjoyments. Right? Yeah. I know I've got to close very quickly, but yes. Quick question, long answer. Yep. <laughs> Disrobe, yeah. That's right. Yep. Disrobing means ceasing to be a monk, going back to lay life. Yeah. Is it like um, how do I say in the when you ordain to be a monk, then there's a, like a like a like a way out say, I try to be a monk, but if it's not successful, I can disrobe. Is there such a? There's no contract when you become a monk. It's uh, some other religious orders have this vow for life, right? But the vow there's no vows made for a monk. You become a monk. And if you can't fulfill its requirements, you declare, the Buddha says, you declare your weakness in your inability to follow the precepts and you drop out and you, and you say to another human being, I am no longer a monk. From this point onwards, you are to consider me as a lay person. I am now a lay person. And that's finished. You're done. You must have the intention to do it. You mustn't be under duress or pressure or stress, right? So what I just said now doesn't actually validate a true disrobing because I'm explaining the process to you. I have no intention of disrobing. So once it's, it's, and it's that simple, it's that quick. No party, no jury and judge, no other monks required or nuns. You can just say it to another human being who understands the significance of what you're saying. Don't say it to a child who doesn't understand what disrobing, well, you're going to get undressed, what for? You know, that's, that, that doesn't count, okay? People talking, and I've heard people talk to trees, thinking that Dave is in the trees as a witness, and no, this doesn't count either. They're still monks and nuns, right? You have to talk to another human being who understands the significance of what you're saying. Yeah. And that's it. Here today, gone tomorrow. Right? As Ajahn Chah would say, quick to put the robe on, quick to take it off. <laughs>